Welcome to the Criterion Chat, a podcast on the Criterion Collection and cinema. I'm Nate Myers, joined by Matt Peterson, as we discuss 2019's The Irishman. Nearly a quarter century after their last collaboration, actor Robert De Niro and director Martin Scorsese re-team for their ninth pairing with The Irishman, adapted by Stephen Zalian from Charles Brandt's book, I Heard You Paint Houses. Telling the purportedly true story of Teamster leader Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance, this sprawling three-and-a-half-hour saga follows the life of Frank the Irishman Sheeran, played by Robert De Niro, over the course of a half-century in both organized crime and labor. Detailing Frank's rise in the Buffalino crime family under the tutelage of Russell Buffalino, enacted by Joe Pesci as he comes out of retirement for this role, the film also shows the blossoming of a friendship between Frank and the famed Jimmy Hoffa, portrayed by Al Pacino in his first collaboration with Scorsese. Using de-aging technology to allow the actors to play their characters in multiple time periods, The Irishman is a more meditative experience than Scorsese's previous forays into the mob genre. The extensive runtime allows the audience to reflect with Frank on the meaning of the events that he recalls and ultimately come to not only a consideration of life as a whole, but the nature of death and the questions of eternity. Expert filmmaking and splendid acting drew great praise from critics and lots of buzz for The Irishman but it ultimately faded quickly from the public's imagination, even as it remains available on Netflix, who helped produce the movie. Released by the Criterion Collection on Blu-ray and DVD in November of 2020, Scorsese's most recent narrative film contains a nice collection of supplements and a fine visual presentation with a suitably low-key sound mix. Join Matt and me as we look back on a life poorly lived. So Matt, as we're kicking off our new year here, I thought it would make sense to maybe pick a, a movie I think we both like an awful lot and is obviously very recently included in the collection. Yeah. And that's what drew me to pick this film here. And so I just thought I'd kick it over to you. What are your initial thoughts on The Irishman? Well, there's so much to talk about here. Um, <laughs> you know, I feel like this is a really misunderstood film uh, in certain circles, you know, you hear the Scorsese, you hear gangster picture, you immediately have a picture in your mind what this film is going to be like, right? I mean, um, we've got the old cast back together, we've got Pesci, we've got De Niro, uh, we've got the excitement of, of Al Pacino being in the mix. So you go into this thing expecting Goodfellas Part Two, right? Uh, and it's anything but. I, the thing I, I love the most about this movie, I think, is just how it's so firmly rooted in where Scorsese is as a filmmaker at this point, right? I mean, this is not uh, Goodfellas Scorsese. This is Scorsese that just made Silence. And and that, uh, you pointed out, you know, the meditative quality of the film in your opening and that's how I really see this film. It is the meditative Scorsese mob movie. And that, that's a pretty extraordinary thing that that even exists, right? Um, so I, I've seen the film three times now, and and this most recent viewing, of course, being on the Criterion Blu-ray. Uh, each time I've watched it, I've really appreciated the subtleties all the more. Um, first time... It was a really kind of exciting event, right? I mean, this is a Scorsese movie premiering on Netflix. I was able to watch it in my home theater. It was just a special thing to be able to see the newest film from, you know, argue, arguably our greatest living director uh, in the comfort of your own home. But with, you know, such a, a sprawling uh, uh, storyline, this uh, exemplary cast, and I was pretty blown away by the experience. But immediately after seeing it that first time, I knew that, okay, this is something I have to revisit, and this is something that I think is going to reward repeat viewings, because it wasn't really what I expected. I mean, the energy level is very, very different, right? Um, And my suspicions are right. I mean, each time I've seen it since then, it's revealed itself 
uh, in new ways. So I guess that's just kind of my initial overview, you know, first reaction to this film. We can, of course, get into more details as we go along. I would like to pick up on your point there about it being misunderstood. I think that's almost the most perfect word to encapsulate the reaction to this film. I think it's misunderstood on a number of levels. One is, of course, what you're saying is there was an anticipation around this movie. It had a lot of uh, buzz and attraction, and there was a couple of trailers that both kind of highlighted it almost like like a Goodfellas part two. It was more jazzy, more exciting looking than it actually is in the actual film itself. Uh, I also think it's misunderstood in that it's obviously for most people been experienced on streaming. I did go see it in the theater in that little bit of a theatrical run that it had prior to going on Netflix. Yeah. Um, it's fun because you look at the, if you look at the box office numbers, you know, the production budget of this was famously around 200, 250 million dollars. It brought in eight million dollars at the box office. So if you're thinking just in the old model of how movies were made, this would be obviously one of the biggest flops in the history of the world, but it's clearly a different marketplace now. Yeah. And I think for people who are used to streaming, this movie almost is antithetical to the habits that have been formed due to streaming, right? Uh, it's on one level much, much, much longer than a typical film would be for any movie going public nowadays, right? You don't have too many three-hour films, certainly not too many three-and-a-half-hour films, but it's also not that long six, seven, eight, ten-hour thing that you might do as a Netflix series or mm -hmm. that you might do as an HBO series, right, that people have become accustomed to. So its pace and its its um, length are quite an anomaly in the year 2019, 2020, as we're coming to this new dawn of cinema and storytelling with, uh, you know, audiovisual images, right? So it's it's really, I think, a film that almost exists outside of the fray. It, it, it really stands apart. And it was a film that when I saw it, I also sat in a theater with, you know, as I, I looked around, I was easily the youngest person there, and I was probably about 36, 37 or something like that around the time that it came out. And as I was looking around the audience, I was like, okay, I'm the youngest person here, obviously by a long shot. I mean, I think the next youngest person was probably mid forties. Uh, clearly this is not something that's going to get traction with kids, right? With a, with a young audience. It just mm -hmm. simply won't. And as I even watched it with that audience, that audience clearly didn't seem to understand it. I think you had a lot of people that maybe remembered things like Goodfellas and how much they loved that when that was in the theaters 30 years ago and now came to see this and saw something that was in a totally different mold that really our culture doesn't promote. I mean, we don't really promote meditation on life. We don't promote a serious consideration of death uh, the way that this film does. And, you know, we, we have another friend, a mutual friend, Matt, that obviously did not like this film. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think both of us were a little taken aback by his pretty strong reaction against it. Uh, and I think that for me, that kind of cemented this idea that it is truly a misunderstood film, which is why I kind of almost have a sense of really wanting to go back and explore it more and more because there is so much here that I really want to help people to see and understand because I think it's important and I think it'd be something that people really engage it in its themes and its storytelling technique and its its uh, pace, its structure, its its camera movement, all these things, it would actually really help people to have not only a better appreciation of cinema, but I think also a little bit more mature, reflective spirit for their own selves, right? Uh, so I really do think this is a film that it doesn't need multiple viewings for you to understand the characters or the story, but I think it really benefits from multiple screenings and viewings in order to truly understand really all the different thoughts and ideas and just kind of let yourself be washed over with them and make them your own as you're going through it and kind of react to it uh, anew. And each time I've watched it, I've had that sort of experience of really feeling a true encounter with something that you don't always get with a movie, especially when you watch it multiple times. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting to characterize this film as an anomaly because it truly is. I mean, I when, when I watch it, it 
it doesn't feel like a conventional film, right? I mean, it's it's too long to be a standard feature film, but as you said, it's too short to really be considered like a miniseries or something that you you might see uh, on a streaming service as kind of a limited event series. So, I mean, what is this film, right? It's it, it exists in that kind of gray zone of of uh, you know, a super high budget film. It's pretty mind blowing that this is a two hundred, two hundred fifty million dollar film. It, it seems kind of ridiculous that that's the budget for it when you when you actually see. I agree. What's up on screen? I mean, granted, there's a lot of visual effects work here that I'm sure we'll go into. Uh, I'm sure much of that uh, cost went to paying actors' salaries, especially. Uh, you know, Joel Pesci coming out of retirement. And I'm sure these, you know, great actors uh, uh, demanded a high salary. But all that aside, you know, this film just, it, it the ambitions of this film are, are clearly very different, right? Scorsese, I think, is taking great advantage of the fact that he is operating within this new paradigm, within the world of Netflix, the world of streaming, that he's given the latitude to create what he wants to create. And he doesn't have to necessarily think about, you know, how many screenings is, is this going to pack in uh, in one day in a theater. Uh, now, when you saw this in the theater, I think maybe I asked you this before, there was no intermission, right? It just played straight through for three and a half hours? Yep, played straight through, no intermission. Yeah, I mean, that's that's... A lot to ask of an audience, I, I think, uh, from a theatrical exhibition standpoint. So the the ambition of this film is really mind-blowing, right? I, I mean, ultimately the film is an exploration of one man's life, Frank Sheeran, you know, played by Robert De Niro. And if you really had to boil it down, that's what the film is about, Clearly, from the opening tracking shot in the in the nursing home that settles in on on, on Robert De Niro, it it's setting the tone immediately. You know, this is a man reflecting on his life as he's approaching the end of it, right? And he, in a way, is a spectator, but also a participant in really some of the most pivotal events of the the mid twentieth century whether he knew it or not. And, you know, De Niro's performance is wonderfully nuanced, I mean, throughout the entire film. And, and you get the sense that, you know, this is not a super intelligent man, right? But this is a very loyal man. And he doesn't necessarily understand what he's caught up in, what he's participating in throughout the film. But his his loyalties, uh, his value of of the idea of friendship are are really exemplified here and i think scorsese actually sees those truly as a virtue even though these are not good people right (laughs) and and scorsese is really a master of making bad people sympathetic And, and not in the sense of you know we're supposed to forgive them for the evil that they're doing but Scorsese is very interested in the idea that, you know, we all have the capability of committing evil and we all have those points in our lives where we have to make the decision uh, whether to participate in that or not. And those choices have consequences. And and that's exemplified here um, and throughout, you know, his entire career, but especially in this film. Yeah, I think, you know, let's talk in a little bit just about the portrayal of Frank, both from De Niro, but also from Scorsese. I think this is a, one of those great examples of a blending of the actor and the director and how both of them really work well together. Obviously, Scorsese and De Niro are one of those truly great actor-director pairings that we've had in movie history, uh, going all the way back to Mean Streets, and then a very frequent com- collaboration there for a while, then it took a little bit of a break, and now, as I said, you know, it's been a, it was almost 25 years from between Casino and now The Irishman, where they work together. Uh, but the two of them really obviously understand each other. Scorsese knows how to to work with De Niro as a director, 
Eric as an actor, and then De Niro understands how to work with Scorsese as a director. So it's really great to see them and to see the kind of respect they have with each other and how that comes through on the screen. And the, you know, the character of Frank Sheeran is an interesting one because historically, you know, there's a lot of people who really are experts on the Jimmy Hoffa stuff, done a lot of investigations. There's other people who've been in the mob that say the guy was kind of making up the story, that it's not true. I, I obviously don't have any way of uh, verifying one thing or the other about the validity of his claims or what happened or didn't happen with Jimmy Hoffa. I think it's almost kind of irrelevant in terms of trying to evaluate and understand this film yeah. uh, because we know that for sure Sheeran in real life was involved in the Teamsters and we know he was involved in the Buffalino crime family. He might have been overstating some things. He might have put himself as being a little bit more important in some areas than he might otherwise have been in terms of how other people viewed him. But I think what this film shows, because it takes time, is the fact that Sheeran, while he is a bad man, I mean, he is, is he loses his family. I mean, he loses his daughters Mm -hmm. because of what he's doing and how he approaches everything. They can't approach him and they wouldn't bring him any of their troubles, their problems. Uh, And that's really done quite in a somber, devastating way, but without any theatrics, right? It's not too many people that could get uh, an Academy Award-winning actress like Anna Paquin to take a part where she has one line of dialogue. Uh, that says something about just the the respect people must have for Scorsese and De Niro to be in this film like that. Well, ironically, there was a lot of criticism over that, that he was diminishing the female characters in some way, which is... Entirely missing the point, in my opinion. Oh, I agree. And it's also to think that her performance is somehow tied to her dialogue, right? I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. She, her, her performance is more than just being able to speak lines of dialogue. And I think any good actor understands that. So it's really it's such a childish complaint, if you ask me. Uh, but I think the fact that they really do show Frank uh, over the course of this film in a very moral light. And I don't mean moral in the sense that they're saying he's a good man. What I mean is they're really contemplating the morality of what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, The fact that they even have those flashbacks to him in World War II, shooting the German soldiers uh, at the orders of his officers, right? And then slowly getting into the criminal underworld and doing things. Uh, It just shows that, you know, this man who must have gotten callous to life in a war you don't just shake that off, right, when you come home. You don't just all of a sudden decide, never mind, life is valuable. You found some way to live with that, and that could that kind of personality, that kind of trait, will find itself getting into the crime world, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I think that, you know, it really is quite an interesting point that's being made there, and that's that especially when you get to that final half hour where really all the other actors have more or less disappeared, right? Uh, Pacino's no longer featured in the film. Pesci is really no longer featured in the film. It's really all De Niro at that point. I think he really knocks it out of the park as an actor. It's a shame he didn't get more, I think, much-deserved respect and support for the work he did here from critics, audiences, because I think this is one of his finer outings as an actor, especially in recent years. Because he really creates a pathos, and you can understand there is kind of an effort at redemption that's taking place within him, you know, and he doesn't even understand exactly why. He understands he wants to be loyal, he understands he wasn't loyal, and he's trying to deal with wrestling with what that means. And, you know, the scenes that he has with the priest are extraordinarily, I think, for people who maybe don't work with older people, uh, you know, Matt, both of us, I think in our work, and our careers, have a lot of interaction with different age groups. Yeah. And so when I'm working with older people, I can tell you, that nails a lot of what's going on with them, personality-wise, psychologically, spiritually. Uh, it really is a truly astonishingly accurate vision of that life, probably because Scorsese and De Niro are themselves in their late 70s at this point, right? So they understand mm-hmm. that in a way that another director or actor wouldn't. And I think that it's just really fascinating to see how he's trying to get absolution, how he's trying to turn away from this, and yet doesn't really even understand what he's turning away from and why. And there's something so very sad about that. 
And I think that's just, you know, a beautifully complex portrayal of humanity that is well worth people really wrestling with. Yeah, the last half hour of this film is just completely devastating to me. I it, It's such a beautifully um, crafted portrait of the end of a man's life, right? Um, I would argue that that last 30 minutes is among the very best of anything Scorsese has done in his career. And I'd have a hard time arguing with that. I mean, it's so it's so deliberately paced. It's so methodical, yet it's so emotional, right? And, I, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people kind of throwing terms around, you know, like sociopath when they're describing Frank Sheeran and, Maybe there's some degree of truth to that, but it's more complicated than that, right? I mean, I think his experience in the war that you pointed out is pretty pivotal here. And the fact that veterans, you know, experience kind of this compassion fatigue or just lack of empathy really as a um, a consequence of necessity for survival, you can't really entirely turn that off right and and that translates itself to your new life once you return home and that doesn't excuse the uh uh, the deeds that that he did or the murders he committed uh but it helps you understand it and at the same time at the end of his life he knows that he needs to be sorry. He needs to repent. And, you know, that conversation with the priest where, where he's talking about the, just the idea that you may not feel it, but you can make an intellectual decision to be sorry, right? And he's really appealing to his um, his humanity in a more objective sense, even though he may not truly feel remorse for what he's done. But at the same time, you know that the fact that he's undergoing this exploration or undergoing these conversations with the priest really implies that he does feel sorry about his life to a degree. Uh, and, and maybe to a, a level that he doesn't quite understand, especially when it comes to his relationship with his daughters, right? I mean, he he tells them that he was doing all this to protect them, but by doing so, it destroyed his relationship with them. And it, there are times where he seems confused by that. There's times where he he seems to understand why that occurred and, and feels great regret for it. So, yeah, the, the layers here are, are wonderfully realized. And, and De Niro just, I, I mean, he's a master, right? And, and he sells this through and through, especially in those last 30 minutes. I, I just, each time I, I've seen the last section of this film, I've just found it tremendously moving. Um, So yeah, yeah, I I would agree. It's among, among Scorsese's best work, uh, especially that last 30 minutes. You know, one of the things that I think has not really come up in discussions of this film that I've seen is just the amount of Catholicism that's at work in it. Uh, Scorsese is famously a Catholic and a fallen Catholic, a, a lapsed Catholic, but still, I mean, it's very clearly important to him. Mm-hmm. And I think in his later years, it's obviously becoming even much more important to him. I mean, he his film before this, like you said, is Silence, which is about Jesuit missionaries in Japan and the persecution and the questions of faith that emerge in that, right? So it's always been in his work in one way or another. But here it's, I think, very explicit. Uh, and... One of the ways I think that you could try to look at this and understand this film is to look at Frank as, in many ways, really showing us the figure of Judas from the Gospels uh, in the sense of the betrayer, right? Uh, Because that's obviously the real big takeaway from the figure of Judas as he comes to us from the, the four Gospels is that he betrays Christ. And Frank's real crime here in the moral sense, is a betrayal. But yeah. who's the betrayal of? Well, it's multifaceted, right? On one level, he betrays the uh, he betrays Jimmy Hoffa, his best friend, who is almost like a brother and a father rolled into one for him. I mean, it's really like a mentor, 
uh, a man that raises him up, makes him a president of one of the uh, Teamster councils, uh, but also is like a, a, a complete comrade in arms, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're right next to each other. They're in the thick of it. And, uh, you know, so he's a betrayer there. He is a betrayer in his family, right? Uh, he obviously walks out on his wife. And I thought just the way they handled that question and his, his voiceover narration uh, was really just apt, you know, just kind of this admitted, it's never good to leave your wife, but that's what I did anyway, right? Uh, so there's there's just kind of an owning, like, I did this. I know it's wrong. I did it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the betrayal of his daughters, of course, not realizing or understanding it. Uh, there's the fact that he ultimately really kind of betrays his country. I mean, he, he serves in the army, but then he goes to serve in the mafia, right? And so you go, like, there's all these layers of betrayal that are taking place. And so I see that, especially that, that final act, really taking the time to unravel the consequences of a life of betrayal. And ultimately, he's alone, right? And really, I think a rich symbolism in this film is is two things. Uh, you have you have the 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 ring that he is given by Russell Buffalino, uh, and I know we got to talk maybe some a little bit about the other cast too, because Joe Pesci I thought was absolutely brilliant in this part of of Buffalino. Yeah, uh, but sure. he gets the ring from him, and he also gets that watch. Right, he has the watch that he's wearing, and you know it's it's the question of what does he choose, right? Uh, and he chooses the ring. Uh, as the as the ultimate loyalty, he decides I'm going to try to be loyal to the Buffalino crime family. Uh, that's where he winds up putting his loyalty, and he lets go of everything else, including the the kind of the watch he gets from the Teamsters. And so I think, you know, it's a fascinating way in which all that symbolism plays in, and he keeps holding on to that ring all the way to the very end, because. That somehow is the thing he attached himself to for whatever principle that he seemed to think that's the thing to hold on to. But he's looking back and going, it must not have been worth it because what do I have from this? I've, I've lost everything. And I, I really love especially just the way it plays out with him and the nurse uh, when he's talking about Jimmy Hoffa. And uh, she doesn't know who Jimmy Hoffa is, which is so very true. I remember talking to a good friend who, uh, this was about probably 15, 20 years ago, we were talking and she had no clue who Jimmy Hoffa was. And I just thought, <laughs> how is that possible that somebody doesn't know who Jimmy Hoffa is? But it's very true. Like this younger generations now, and I know we're off, we're off after uh, Hoffa's time ourselves, but you know, G- young people don't know who he was. Yeah. But it's fascinating because the priest is trying to get information from Frank and get him to come out and say things, right? Obviously, the priest's motive is for Frank's forgiveness for him to be really, truly reconciled and let go of everything, right? You have the FBI agents that visit. They're trying to get it all out, and they're trying to get it from it for their reasons, which is they just want a full account of the story. They want to get the uh, the the details so they can figure out what happened with Hoffa and close a case and you know kind of put something solid in this. And he rejects both of them to some extent, right? He doesn't really ever fully explain anything. He he makes the question about that phone call. The priest asks, what about that phone call? What phone call? And he doesn't really say anything, right? He's about to unload everything on that nurse. She's about to get the whole story, and it nails it perfectly because she's like, I don't even care. And she's just like, why don't you just, just, you know, kind of be quiet. and Let's get this taken care of here. And then she's on her way. And I just think it's so fascinating. The film pecks up a great, great truth, which is that a younger generation sometimes comes along and isn't even interested in the story of how we got where we are in our humanity and isn't able to hear the lessons of the older generation, which in a certain sense might explain some of the reaction to this film, right? Uh, that it played out, the, the, the reaction publicly to this film might have played out just like what we see in the final th- uh, 30 minutes with those different a- interactions he has. Uh, and so I just think that this film really, in its portrayal of the religiosity of Frank and of his desire for reconciliation uh, and his seeking out uh, some way of restoring that betrayal that he had made, really makes it almost a tragedy. I mean, it really kind of plays Shakespearean in that regard. Yeah, absolutely it does. And I'm glad you highlighted that scene with the nurse at the end, because that, that one really stands out to me, too. And and it really undercuts um, Sharon's entire life in some ways, right? I mean, just the fact that he 
uh, was so committed to, to Jimmy Hoffa and, you know, so committed to the, uh, Buffalino crime family and, and all the, the, you know, the sacrifices he, he felt that he made and they're just kind of shrugged off by this nurse in, in a way because she has no idea who these people are. Right. <laughs> and I, I guess I never got the sense that he was going to like spill his entire story to her. I, it seemed to me more that, again, it was just undercutting his life in an unexpected way. I mean, he was almost showing off that picture of him with Jimmy Hoffa, you know, expecting a reaction, right? Like, oh, look at this. Like, I'm, this is, I've got a picture of Jimmy Hoffa. And she ends up having no idea who he is, even when, when he's called out by name. So, yeah, it's it, it's an interesting uh, perspective to say that, okay, the film is really making a point of uh, how we do disregard our elders' experiences and, and we're not paying close enough attention to what we can learn uh, from those, those lives that have been lived. Um, and uh, if there's an important theme to, to pick out of this film, I mean, I think that that's probably a good one. Uh, it, it is pretty interesting though how the general reaction to this film, you know, seemed to be one of confusion. I guess I, I, I don't know how you would best characterize. It. I mean, I, I guess I, I started out by saying it's misunderstood, and I, I still stand by that. But I, I really think people did not know what to make of this film, and and still really don't. I, it, I, I think it's the kind of film that will benefit from the passage of time, right? Uh, especially, you know, hopefully Scorsese is going to be with us for many years, but uh, when he does eventually pass and leave us, I think people are going to look back at this film with an entirely new perspective and an entirely new sense of reverence because even though Scorsese is still making other projects and uh, and is about to, to shoot another hugely expensive epic from the sounds of it. This does seem like his swan song in many ways, at least his swan song when it comes to the genre he's most well known for, right? The mob genre. And, uh, it it will be interesting to see how this, this film is viewed in time. I certainly hope it does get that reappraisal that you're, you know, projecting here that it would, that'll get, I think it, it definitely will benefit from just an audience that's willing to take the time to to consider it and to think of it and reflect on it. And part of it might be just the need for people in general to kind of become less obsessed in the moment. I mean, this is, this is like the anti-social media movie, to be honest. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But I think, I think this film is really going to benefit from people really looking back at it. And maybe it's worth just kind of focusing in and honing it a little bit on how Scorsese approaches it as a director. Because, like you said, he's well known for the mob genre. I think actually probably a little bit more attention is given to that than should be. Because he's made a lot of films and only a few of them really are directly mob movies, right? Uh, Mean Streets deals with the mob, but it's not exactly a full-blown mob movie. But, you know, I think you could say it's... Mobster, mobsterish, right? You have some references to the mob in Raging Bull, but it's not really a mob movie. I don't think anybody would say it. So then your real clear, clear mob movies are Goodfellas, which everybody remembers and celebrates. Uh, then also Casino, which people have deep, um, just a, a real deep uh, kind of appreciation for nowadays. I think that movie wasn't super well received when it first came out, but it, it's grown in its estimation. You have The Departed, which is dealing with the mob, yep. right? And so these films are, you know, obviously his major kind of entries into it. This film is in many ways almost like a, a deliberate, like, uh, it's a deliberate, what's the word I want here? This is a deliberate subversion of, of the genre as, as it was told there. And I think one of the neat things you'd mentioned, Matt, earlier was the opening, right? And the tracking shot that takes place there uh, and how slow it is, right? Compared to, say, the tracking shot that everybody remembers from Goodfellas when it goes into the Coca Cabana. Yeah. It, it's so slow and meditative. And then later on, you have a similar tracking shot 
which is when they kill the big boss and the camera is doing this track shot. It's very nice, very eloquent. Uh, and then all of a sudden it goes away from the action and the violence. You don't even see the kill. And it looks at these flowers, kind of like a funeral arrangement flowers, actually, uh, that happen at the end of that tracking shot. But the camera's moving slowly. It's moving very slowly as it moves around. And I just think to myself, this isn't because Scorsese's no longer got the jazz that he used to have. I mean, I think The Wolf of Wall Street clearly shows that he's got a lot of energy still as a director. It's because sure, he yeah. understands he wants this film to be that slow, considerate pace and he even uses his camera because he loves to move the camera in a way that helps establish that tone for his audience and that's just the mark of a smart director and a good director who knows my camera will be the tool by which I establish what I want my audience to do in this film and so I think it's it's a real highlight and testimony to him and his his skill and his insights as a director how he uses the camera here. And, and the pacing too. I mean, it, to me, the pacing of this film is like, it's like an old person remembering a story or telling a story, right? And, and it's not that it's not interesting. It's just deliberate. And it's not necessarily completely lacking of energy. It just has a different quality to the energy, right? Uh, old people tend to have habits. And this film is very much about highlighting the habits of the characters. I mean, I just the opening of the film when they're hitting the road and, you know, De Niro is mapping out their, their route and he's got his, his map on the table. He's got his permanent marker and he's drawing the highways and, and he's talking about, you know, Russell's preferences in terms of uh, travel and, and their wives having to stop for smoke breaks and, and, you know, uh, Russell's taking a nap in the front seat and all these very deliberate, habitual details are very clearly highlighted in the film. But it's reflected in the pacing and the uh, the use of the camera and the editing in such a way that that accentuates um, the fact that this is a film really about old people. Right. <laughs> I mean, we, granted, we're, we're following these people over many decades, but they're never really truly all that young at any point in the film. I mean, I guess you could say that De Niro's character at the very beginning when he's driving the truck is supposed to be maybe in his, uh, I don't know, late 20s, early 30s or something. But uh, beyond that, you know, these are people that are kind of approaching the end of their lives throughout most of the film or at least in uh, middle-aged or later. And, you know, Scorsese is an older man as well, right? And his his style of filmmaking is going to reflect that in some ways. And, uh, you know, I want, I want to mention Silence again because I, I think that's a film that's criminally overlooked. I, I, I love that film. I think uh, it's been really kind of swept swept away already even though it's only a few years old and and that's a very interesting companion piece to this film and if i think if people really want to understand why this film is the way it is they need to go back and look at silence uh, because that's another film that's very deliberate that doesn't have your traditional flashy scorsese uh, moments but is still brilliantly directed and uh wonderfully effective in its choices in terms of how the camera's used, how the, ed how the editing is, is utilized. So uh, I, I see those films as interesting companion pieces here. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if you have anything else to add there, Nate. We probably should start talking about some of the other cast members here too. Well, maybe before we get to the cast, just to kind of pick it up on your point about the structure, uh, the script by Steven Zalian, I think, is extremely good. It's smart to have those details, like you said, about, yeah, you know, I'm going to take this highway, then I'm going to cut over to that highway, which is exactly how old people would have talked and told the story, right? Yeah. The script really has a strong way of conveying this person of Frank Sheeran, and then through him, 
getting you to understand the other people around him, right? And so the script is very, very good. I really think Stephen Zalian uh, did a great job with this screenplay. He's obviously a very famous screenwriter, fa- uh, won the Oscar years and years ago for Schindler's List, uh, and has been working for many years uh, in different uh, different areas. So, uh, But this is, I think, a real testimony to just having a good screenplay because it is balancing and bouncing between a lot of different time periods. You have the little bit of Frank telling the story from the nursing home. Then you have him uh, obviously going back to when he was a young uh, driver just working out uh, in the kind of getting a little bit of the taste of criminal activity by stealing from his company and then eventually moving from there into the actual organized crime. And you follow him to the point where he actually will then become friends with um, with Al Pacino as Jimmy Hoffa. And I think that the story is just extremely well written and you get some good good dialogue here and also just a good understanding of when not to have dialogue uh in these particular cases but the voiceover narration here is a large part of why i think it works and helps create that meditative and that sort of sense of recalling life uh that we would get from this if you took the the voiceover narration out i don't think this film would be nearly as effective as it really is uh, voiceover narration can sometimes, some people love it, some people hate it. There are plenty of examples where it gets in the way, but this is an example where I think it's very much a part of the success of the film and it adds a dimension to it that otherwise wouldn't exist. So I just, I really like this, uh, this film's screenplay and think it, it does a great job of taking the story and molding it for us to really see some deep themes. Yeah, and the voiceover is kind of a stylistic callback to his other mod films too. I mean, Goodfellas, of course, famously has uh, a strong use of voiceover. So that, that element is kind of a carryover that does connect this to some of his other films in this genre, but at the same time, it's very different, right? I mean, this is um, not kind of like a braggadocious sort of voiceover or, or something that's supposed to be comedic or, uh, or, punctuating the action in an unexpected way it's as you said it's a man just telling his story and uh anyone who has grandparents anyone who's had conversations with older people you understand this type of storytelling and it's it's captured wonderfully here and and again it's reflected in just the style of the film throughout and I, i think that's what caught a lot of people off guard watching this film is just how um, yeah, how deliberate it is, how uh, unexpected uh, the film is in, in tone and in pacing at times. Uh, but if you really understand, I think what Scorsese is trying to do here, it makes complete sense. Yeah, well, let's get, then delve into those supporting uh, performances because I think there's also great work happening there. The clear two, obviously, that everybody really did take a shining to were Joe Pesci and Al Pacino. Both were nominated for Oscars for their work in this. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly will say I think Pacino's good in this film, but he's definitely not playing Jimmy Hoffa as I think of Jimmy Hoffa. Um, it's interesting to see his performance in comparison to, say, Jack Nicholson's performance back in the movie Hoffa from the early 1990s, because I think Hoffa, or excuse me, Jack Nicholson really clearly was trying to become Jimmy Hoffa. Al Pacino's more interested, I think, in doing an interpretation of the essence of Hoffa, not really trying to replicate Hoffa in his portrayal here. Uh, but I do like Pacino's take, and I do like how you know he just really kind of creates a, a strong presence in his scenes and an unpredictability in his scenes, which you can understand why that's going to start to lead to his downfall, uh, because he is unapologetic about who he is. And having gotten mixed into the crime organization with the Teamsters, uh, he's going to then use, you know, run afoul because he wants to be in control of the Teamsters, but the the mob wants that money and wants that money to do things, and he's going to just be doing his own thing. And so it just really, I see Pacino's performance showing the the folly of a massive ego, as I think the best way to take what he brings to his portrayal of Hoffa, that Ultimately, it's a man who had incredible talent, incredible power, incredible skill, 
but was undone because he just simply overestimated himself as he was dealing with many complex issues and people. Yeah, I mean, clearly he's taking the angle of, of an egomaniac here. And and I, I would agree with you. I think Pacino's very good. Uh, his performance does kind of teeter on the the cartoonish at times to me. Um, you know, we talked about Donnie Brasco recently, our, one of our um, Deep Focus episodes, available on YouTube for those of you that don't know. Um, Please subscribe. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, that's kind of an interesting comparison here, too, because, you know, I, I see Pacino's performance in this film as similar to Donnie Brasco's um, performance or his performance as Lefty and that they're both quite fragile characters, right? I mean, they, they really put on this facade of intimidation and power and ego, but they have a real fragility to them that makes them sympathetic and relatable. Uh, but also it makes you understand how Robert De Niro's character, you know, Frank Sheeran can become uh, such a close friend to uh, Al Pacino's Jimmy Hoffa. So, you know, his performance has to have a relatable, sympathetic quality to it for that that friendship and the depth of that friendship to be resonant and to be believable. So, um, yeah, as you said, it's it's a man whose ego is overshadowing the the threats he's uh, truly facing. Uh, but it's an effective performance, but not the not the highlight for me in this film. I would say. Well, I will say from an acting perspective in this film, I, I think De Niro's very good, extremely strong, but I really have to say I think Pesci is the best performance of the whole bunch. Uh, he's such an interesting actor because you know, his career, he's obviously been very famous and he had quite a celebrity of sorts playing that tough guy, obviously like in Goodfellas or uh, you could think about even um, My Cousin Vinny where he you know played a very comedic kind of play on that sort of tough, loudmouth Italian. Uh, and then, obviously, famously slapsticky in the Home Alone movies, right? But, but Pesci is, I think, an actor of incredible intelligence and in how he creates a character. And he does create, in Buffalino here, just a really, really sinister force, but also a very non-threatening-seeming force, too, right? Uh, I mean, you know, he. The, I think of the scene particularly where he's uh, the two scenes that we have with him trying to make uh, kind of a break in with Frank's daughter, where you know they had the one in the Buffalo, uh, or excuse me, in the bowling alley, and then you have the one at Christmas, and you know clearly the daughter's like this is not a good man, and yeah. uncomfortable around him, and he's trying to be just a nice grandfatherly figure to her, and simply is awkward. I mean, there is something kind of intimidating about him. It's something, yes, he's trying to be nice, trying to be generous, uh, but he's not able to really come across authentic in that because his true self is the cold, calculating mob boss who is going to organize things so business keeps running smoothly, doesn't want to go into violence if he can avoid it, but is not at all afraid to go ahead and kill people. And like you see the, she the scene where he's with his wife, where he's got the blood on, and she's willing to just get it cleaned for him. You know, it's it's just the way, uh, you know, he creates this very strong presence, but without doing the usual things we associate with him from, say, Goodfellas, where he's loud and wild. It's just a very cold, strong, demanding uh, kind of bo uh, crime boss that is quite chilling. Yeah, chilling is the word I think of here. And... I, it's an incredible balance he strikes because th there's a real warmth to his character, you know, at times, even though we're talking about how chilling he is, there's this real dichotomy to, to his performance. And, and some of those scenes between him and Robert De Niro, especially when they're talking about Italy and the war and Italian and uh, sharing the bread and the wine, and uh, there's a real sense of camaraderie and warmth there. And you can see that they're making a real human connection. Um, but at the same time, there's always this sinister undercurrent and you know that he is a very dangerous man. 
Um, and one of my favorite scenes in the film, though, is when Frank Sheeran, um, after he blows up that uh, that laundry, <laughs> and sits down with Harvey Keitel and, and Joe Pesci, and and it's revealed that uh, the laundry uh, was partially owned by by Harvey Keitel's character, and he pretty much tells De Niro that you know if it wasn't for Buffalino and their friendship, he'd be a dead man. And that scene is so beautifully realized, and and you just the expression on Pesci's face throughout that scene is incredible, right? The, he he's creating this environment of tension. He's contributing to it. He's allowing it to play out. Uh, yet there's this little glint in his eye that he knows that you know Frank Sharon is going to be fine because he's his friend, but he's not going to, you know, avoid making him sweat, right? (laughs) He's going to impress upon him. Well, it's like he understands the the value of him sweating there is that he'll learn the lesson so that he's going to learn what he needs to do is to never get in this situation again, right? Well, Well, even beyond that, he's impressing upon him the value of their friendship, right? And without feeling that threat, without feeling that tension, he's not going to feel the same relief uh, when he realizes that his friendship is what's saving him, his friendship with Russell. So it's just a beautifully realized scene. It's such a simple scene, too. I, I, you know, I, I had sent out a uh, text to, to you and another friend of ours, uh, even today, I think, just uh, linking the scene between uh, Michael Corleone and... Uh, Fredo in Godfather Two, uh, the confrontation scene, you know, in in that kind of porch uh, with the snow falling outside, and just the power of two men in a room, you know, just two brilliant actors playing out a scene, and and here we have just three legendary actors sitting at a table, delivering just this powerful moment, and it, it's it's one of the best scenes in the film, so. To me, that that friendship uh, is a very, very interesting aspect of this film, and ultimately, it's that friendship that you know Frank Sheeran chooses over all else, including his own family. And you wonder, you know, is this because he truly feels the most connection with Russell, or is it out of a sense of fear that he knows that you know among all his friends, these people are the most powerful? And if he goes against them, then he's truly at risk, and so is his family. Uh, so is it is it a an allegiance, you know, fed by fear? Is it an allegiance uh, that he's going to uphold out of a sense of self preservation? Uh, I, I guess that's one of the questions I think this film asks too: is is this a self serving loyalty ultimately? that that um, Frank Sheeran is exhibiting. And Joe Pesci's character has to be very threatening uh, for that that theme to come through. Yeah, the film does a great job of sh- setting up his character of Russell Buffalino, uh, both in relation to Frank, but just in general. I mean, the, there's that quick portion where he does the direct camera address and he speaks to us yeah. and saying... Listen, I don't want to have multiple things getting back to me, all right? If you're going to be the one I give the job to, you get it done. You don't give it to somebody else. And just the fact that they direct that to have it be uh, him speaking directly into the cameras, talking to the audience, it gives you a sense that, because that's the only real true, like, complete fourth wall break in the film. The others are close to it, sometimes with Frank as he's narrating, but it's not quite a fourth wall break like that is. Mm -hmm. And so it's like... That's the power of just a simple directorial decision about how you present a character uh, because you have him speak directly to the audience like, hey, I'm not even bound by the rules of a movie. I can, I can break those and talk to you in the, in the theater or in, the, in your home living room, right? So I think that's just some smart direction and screenwriting there. But also, like you said, I mean, having that scene with Frank early on where it clearly shows you're alive because of me, right? And Carvey Keitel playing Angelo Bruno saying, you don't know how lucky you are or how good a man he is, right? 
uh, also highlighting that point of why Frank would have this. But even the first, the, when Frank's recalling their first encounter, right, he's, he fixes the engine for Frank as he's a, just a truck driver. Yeah. So all of it's kind of being presented as a power structure for Russell. He's helping Frank, but he's in control. And Frank's kind of always in his debt. And basically, when he says, I'm going to have you kill Jimmy Hoffa, he's calling in the debt. Like, this is how you're going to do this, right? And Yeah, but he's, you know, he the, still sells it to him as though he's doing him a favor, right? Like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. And it's like, hey, listen, it's, it's going to happen, but I'm doing a favor for you to help this. But I love how they set that scene up because it's very matter of fact. They don't really say exactly what's happening. It's like like you would in the mob. You wouldn't say, I'm going to have you go kill Jimmy Hoffa. They're just saying, you're going to do this. And, oh, you're going to catch that. And, oh, that's going to, you know, it's like, you know what's going to take place. And Frank understands what's taking place. But just the way he kind of slowly lets Frank into, this has been the plan all along. This whole road trip, everything about it has been leading to this point, And I've been orchestrating this without Frank even necessarily realizing what was going on. And that's, it's very... Like well, we said the word chilling earlier, and that's kind of I think the perfect word for it. It's like, yeah, he's he's friendly. They you know, they go out to dinner, they talk, they do stuff, you know. But it's just kind of a, you know, not a kind of a nonchalant, non personal thing. Of by the way, we're gonna kill a man, and you're gonna do it even if he's your friend. Yeah, that scene is so uh, uh, very memorable. I mean, in the Howard Johnsons, where they're just like eating cereal or I think he's eating total or something. <laughs> it's like uh nonchalantly talking about this and then Frank realizes what's happening. And and just as you said, it's it's being orchestrated, right? So it really starts the night before where um Russell's back in the kitchen making that salad, talking about the the red wine vinegar and the uh, Catania olives and all these details and and saying oh you know this is what's going to happen tomorrow and and Frank's confused and then yeah it's not until the next morning where it, it's it's made very clear but um, again I, I just love the simplicity of that scene I love the pacing of it how quiet that scene is right it's just two men sitting in this like empty diner uh discussing something that's so completely devastating yet is not explicit and yeah the subtext there is beautiful and it, it's that kind of starts it, that really leads into the last 30 minutes right that part of the film where things become even more deliberate and even more matter of fact and and the shots are almost very flat and they're and the editing is very um not flashy in any way and it, it's so antithetical to what you'd expect from scorsese in a film like this and that's what i i think is so brilliant about it too and it, it's still very very effective you know on, on its surface it may seem like gosh this is a really boring way to present this right but this is all intentional and and it's really the right choice for the material. Well, I think it's also part of, you know, the like I said, who knows the, about the true veracity of the the tale that Frank Sheeran told uh, yeah. about him being involved in this, right? It sounds like there's good reason to be skeptical about this. Uh, but the fact that it's presented without all that flash and kind of high energy does make this very different experience. And I think it... It doesn't lead into the sensationalism that you could easily do. And in a certain sense, it undercuts even if if Frank Sheeran was lying and making up a story to sell books, to get some money, whatever it might have been. Uh, it almost deliberately works against him doing that because it makes this so very stupid, pathetic, uh, idiotic. Right. And that scene in the, the hotel lobby as they're having breakfast it's just it is clearly a pivot point in the film. Uh, we haven't talked about it much, but from the the sound design, right, uh, as is often the case with Scorsese and period pieces too, he likes using a lot of music. He likes having s songs constantly playing around, right? Because uh, obviously it's something he remembers from that era, and it's true. I think in those previous eras, music just played all the time. People just had it on in a way that they don't always now. And they didn't have headphones and things like they do now, so you just had music around all the time. 
And at that scene, it gets just very quiet. Like, all the music goes away, and it really stays away for the rest of the film. There's a little bit of something that comes up, but it's pretty mild at that point. And the one, except for the wedding scene, which is almost done in a ironic uh, way, in which they're, uh, you know, kind of almost highlighting the absurdity of this wedding taking place after the assassination of Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, it's just really, really smart how you use a subtle move like that, taking away all the music and then having it play out almost like a History Channel documentary reenactment or something uh, really does make it quite uh, touching. And I think just even the way they portray the death of Jimmy Hoffa compared to some of the other hits that are shown in the film is so different because the others have a little bit more flash, a little bit more style. There's a little bit more yelling and stuff. With this, it's just, eh, looks around, let's get out of here. And then he gets shot. And then that sound that Pacino makes, I think Pacino does a great job acting his death as Jimmy Hoffa. That sound he makes of just kind of a, oh, it's like a surprise. It's a hurt. And it's like he, it's like he almost has a moment of realization of what happened to him in that moment of death, which probably you would think is part of what stays with Frank. You know, I mean, whether that would actually have been what happened or not, it, for the audience, you hear in that little bit of noise from Jimmy Hoffa dying, as portrayed by Al Pacino, the, the betrayal and the, the, the true wound of what took place there it wasn't just a killing. It was the killing of a friend, right? And I think those touches just make that final leg of the film so much better. Uh, it just, it's, it's really quite a masterpiece, to be honest. I, I, I could have done without the whole fish dialogue, though, to be honest. It, th- that came across as a little too Tarantino to me. <laughs> that all interchange about the fish in the back seat and this and that. And, um, I, 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 understand, I understand why it's there. It's fine. It's fine. It just it seemed a little out of character with uh, the film at that point. But it, it's a small gripe. Well, let's maybe just highlight just a little bit some of the filmmaking uh, Rodri- uh, excuse me, Rodrigo Prieto was the director of photography, uh, and Thelma Schoonmaker, as always, is the editor. Uh, I think their work here is extremely good, and uh, the production design also is quite strong. Uh, it's a film that really, as you said earlier, Matt, it's not especially flashy or calling attention to itself, but it's not without style either, right? It's just the, the, it's pitched in this very neutral way. Uh, not to say it doesn't look handsome, that it isn't expertly crafted, but it just is somber. And I think that's the right tone to create in terms of just the technique that's going on here. The The lighting isn't particularly dramatic. It's often very plain. Uh, the sets are very simple. They're not these elaborate kinds of, oh, they're meeting in some secret headquarters to talk about how they're going to kill Hoffa, right? It's it's just set in an old hotel lobby. And I just think all those decisions really do add up, and maybe that's part of why the film didn't resonate with certain audiences, because it doesn't play like a Godfather or uh, a Goodfellas, where you have such really stylized and strong imagery and and visual movement and editing, this just plays pretty neutral. And I think that's exactly the right thing to do. I don't know, were there any specific highlights in terms of the the production value of the the execution of the film that you'd like to talk about right now? Well, I I think Rodrigo uh, Prieto had some big challenges here, right? I mean, um, of course, Scorsese's worked with some legendary DPs, Robert Richardson and uh, Michael Ballhaus. And, you know, it's like, how do you bring something new to this uh, this style of film? And I, the the color timing is actually has some subtle variation throughout the film, um, depending on the era, kind of mimics some of the, the film stocks of those times. And it ends, I think the film... It, ends in the 1970s or 1980s maybe and and that's kind of the more you know desaturated kind of almost bleach bypass look to the end of the film uh well it'd be more also, like 2000 
Is it that late? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there are some subtle uses of color, you know, in terms of the color timing that that's variable throughout the film. But as you said, it's not flashy. It's not meant to be. Uh, there are some tracking shots and there are, there are some, you know, Scorsese like uses of the camera, but overall it's, it's a pretty functional film and, and fairly, uh, minimalist in terms of how it's presenting the material. And again, I, I think stylistically that's in, in keeping with what Scorsese is going for here. Um, well, we, we should probably talk about the visual effects. I mean, that, that's kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to this film a lot, too. There's a lot of discussion about the de-aging effects, and, and I'm not sure, how, sure. Much of, how much of the budget went into that. Um, I, I, I guess I don't, I don't want to spend a whole ton of time on that because I feel like there's been so much said on it. I, I guess the way I look at it is this. It, it's kind of an unnecessary evil in this film. Uh, you know, this film is taking place over many decades and the actors are old men in real life, right? So (laughs) the way, you know, De Niro carries himself and walks is very different than the way he carried himself and walked 30, 40 years ago or, you know, when he was the age he was in, say, Taxi Driver. And even though you're de-aging his face, those qualities still come through and do kind of break the illusion to a degree. I I guess that's the biggest issue I had uh, with some of the de-aging is, you know, maybe they should have used body doubles more here or there if they were modifying the faces anyway. And and I I think there are times where the de-aging effects are very effective and actually are quite transparent and I don't even really notice them, especially if you're getting into a longer scene and after a while they just kind of disappear into the the fabric of the scene because uh, it, it tells me that they're pretty effective. You just kind of get used to them. But but there are times, especially early on, I, I do think of the scene between Joe Pesci and De Niro at the gas station. That's one scene that really stands out to me is just not very effective and maybe that's because the visual effects were pushing things too far, trying to make them look a lot younger than they clearly are. Uh, but overall, I, I think it works quite well. I, I know there's a lot of YouTube videos out there with deep fakes that are trying to improve upon the uh, the visual effects here. And, and, and there may be shots here or there that look better than what's in the final film, but... Um, some pretty Can sophisticated. Say, those tech- videos, those videos with the deep fake are such bullshit. I mean, for well, a they're, wide they're variety using, of reasons. They're they're using clips from other films, right? So it's like you're blending an existing piece of film over, you know, a shot from this film. So it, it, they're kind of disingenuous in that you know, it, exactly. it's not cre- it's not creating an it, it's not capturing a new performance. It's just using an element of an old performance sinking it to the dialogue. So I, I, I think it's it's difficult. And they don't always look that much better than they make themselves out to look like. Look at how no, much it, I was able to do versus how much they did with $200 million. Like, yeah, okay, that's just yeah. stupid, you know. Well, it is. But, and, and again, they're, they're trying to create a new original performance here. And I, I think that's the, the detail that people forget about when they're looking at these deep fakes. And... Overall, I, I think it works fine. And, you know, should they have used different actors maybe for the younger counterparts in, in this film that many, many other films have done over the years? I don't know. Maybe. Um, and, but it doesn't take me out of the film enough to really hurt the experience, I guess. And at the end of the day, that's probably what really matters. Um, I, I, I do think that what is accomplished here is pretty extraordinary. And the fact that Scorsese, you know, it took many, many years for this film to to see the light of day. I think a lot of the reason was because he was probably waiting for the technology to catch up with his ambition. But uh, yeah, I I don't know what your thoughts are on the visual effects. I, I, I feel like people really talk about that more than the quality of the film itself, which is unfortunate. 
I agree. It's probably overemphasized. I also think it's over criticized too. It's it's not perfect, but overall it's successful, right? I, I don't think it's as anywhere near as distracting as anybody th- makes it out to be, especially as you're watching the film and you get into it. The more you just into it, the more it just disappears, like you were saying. Uh, there are some moments, there are certain shots, or sometimes where the eyes don't quite look right. Uh, that's what I notice most when I'm thinking about the special effects. Like, eh, some of the shots with De Niro and his eyes just don't quite seem to work perfectly. But otherwise, I mean, it's, it's I think, mostly successful. It's, it's in many ways kind of a new stage in terms of how you would do makeup, right? You used to do makeup to make people look younger or older. That's kind of the technique they're trying to go through here. The technology is not perfect. It'll continue to get better. Uh, so that's going to be obviously something, I think, with time that you'll start to see more of this and it'll be even better than it is now. Uh, I think it was, like I said, a necessary evil. It's part of what you need to do. Uh, the real film to try to compare this to is is really, I think, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, which we did an episode on that film uh, many years ago on this podcast. And that film, I think, is much more successful in how it blends digital technology with an actor and makes a, a character because they use more body doubles, right? And I think that would have been something that could have been beneficial here in certain scenes. The one scene I think a lot of people like to point out is the scene where De Niro goes and beats up the grocery shop owner uh, yeah. for having uh, kind of pushed his daughter. And I just, you know, it's funny because I look, I've watched that scene a couple of times and you could definitely tell, yeah, De Niro's older and his his posture and the way he kind of, the way he's holding his arm, it looks almost like his arm is injured or something like that. Like he had it in a cast or something like that that day. I don't know why. But I also kind of go, I think people are so used to movies that they kind of don't know what those sorts of situations look like in real life. Uh, they're clumsy. They're awkward. People kind of stumble around and aren't sure where to place themselves. It's like, they're not choreographed in real life. That yeah. scene actually, I think, plays better than people sort of say it does. It does look weird and clumsy and awkward. I imagine if you were to watch somebody from across the street beat the hell out of a grocer, you would think it looked weird and awkward. And so I just think that that scene actually captures kind of the lack of glamour in that kind of action and behavior. And I, I kind of actually like it, even though I can see that, yeah, there's a little bit the the shoulders kind of rounding forward more than you would have at that age, typically. Uh, but the other thing I think people sometimes forget here is, and this is just the thing that kind of works against the de-aging process, is we all know what De Niro, Pacino, Pesci looked like 30, 40, 50 years ago. This isn't trying to make a young Robert De Niro be in the movie. It's trying to show a young Frank Sheeran. And I, if you watch the supplements on the on the de-aging effects, that's actually one of the things they say, that we could have done exactly kind of what the deep fake does. They didn't want to. They wanted to do something else, and they are trying for something else to capture not Robert De Niro at the age of 50 or the age of 40, but rather Frank Sheeran as portrayed by Robert De Niro at the age of 50 or 40. And that's a, a subtle difference, but I think it is something that for an audience that's grown up like you and I have, Matt, watching these actors... It's going to throw you off a little bit because I still remember Goodfellas De Niro, Taxi Driver De Niro. I remember Godfather Pacino and Scent of a Woman Pacino. And so you're kind of thrown off a little bit by it because you have all these other images that are flashing through your head of what they should look like. And I think that's just one of the, the inherent challenges filmmakers will run into as they keep trying to do the de-aging effects in movies. Yeah, you always get that little you know, unca- uncanny valley effect here or there, but it's pretty few and far between in this film. I, I really do think overall they do a pretty good job, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, you, when your intent is to create a younger version of a fictional character played by a real actor <laughs> that's been around in the movies for decades, it, it's going to confuse the audience. And ultimately it's just going to come across as like a bad visual effect at times and even though the intent may have been exactly what's up on the screen um it's a confusing thing to convey you it'd know? be interesting to watch this film with um with an audience that doesn't know these actors and doesn't know they did digital de-aging and just see would they pick up on things would they not pick up on things because you and i are coming into it with a whole wealth of knowledge that maybe a young audience wouldn't come into it with, and it'd be interesting to see if they saw it or reacted to it differently than us. 
Yeah, I, it, it probably wouldn't be nearly as distracting, I, I would think. Um, I, I still think there's going to be moments where someone's still going to look at it and be like, ah, that, that looks kind of weird. But um, overall, I think it's very strong work, and, and they developed some pretty sophisticated technology with, um, with the camera, uh, you know, shot with three cameras simultaneously to be able to map out all the, uh, the faces properly for the digital effects. So uh, very technically ambitious film, uh, even though uh, the, the camera movement or the camera work in and of itself may not look flashy, it, it sounds like it was a very time-consuming, meticulous process to make all this work. Well, that's one thing I think maybe that is different about this than, say, other films, which is a great leap forward for this, is that part of the... Scorsese's hesitation was you could have done the de-aging stuff years ago over a decade ago right uh it's been getting developed you know really since Benjamin Button uh but he didn't want to have them do like wearing the golf balls and all the little stuff on their face and having that get in the way of the performance he wanted to have the actors look at another human face and respond to it and he wanted himself as a director to look at their face and respond to it and this Technology was, I think, the first time a film did the de-aging without all that extra stuff on the face because, like you said, it had multiple lenses and multiple cameras running together to collect information, including some of the infrared, right? And so yeah. you're getting a whole bunch of infrared, which then takes away tons of the shadow, which allows them to go in and see the face so much differently than would have been uh, what you would have done with a typical camera. Uh, so I, I do think that there is a, a, a actual breakthrough that did take place here. And as in any case, when you have special effects, the first breakthrough isn't going to look as good as it's going to after three, four, five generations of it. Uh, and so it just it's 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 a new technology. I think mostly successful, mostly without even really calling attention to itself. Uh, and you know, by and large, I th- I'd say it, it overall I think is to the betterment of the film. But there's occasional times where it does get in the way. But for the most part, I'd say it's a it's a net plus. Well, maybe, Matt, we talked about Criterion's release of the film. I know we both picked it up on Blu-ray here. Uh, I thought it's a really great release. I, I love the the packaging of it. I know some people have really had uh, a dislike of the cover art. I've actually come to really like it as that kind of water painting uh, of the, the hand with the ring on it. So I, I just think that's kind of a neat cover art, actually, and uh, just a good, another good example of why we still need physical media uh, for home theaters. Uh, so I thought it was a really good release. What are your thoughts on the release? Yeah, I'm not crazy about the cover, I guess. I, it's fine. You know, I, I, I like painted, more stylized covers. Um, I, I'm not sure it would attract new viewers necessarily. <laughs> Unless you've seen the film, it's hard to know the the I'm certain it will not. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, But it's a beautiful package. You know, it's got some nice interior artwork as well. Um, I I haven't had a chance to go through all the the features. Um, It it does include some material, I think, that was available online uh, from Netflix as well. But uh, there's some new new material here, too, that I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into. just haven't had a chance to yet. Yeah, so I really like, I, I did get through the disc material. Like I said, some of it's just sort of even just slightly re-edited of what was there from Netflix. And then there are some new features as well. Uh, I do like all of that. Uh, again, a lot of it probably be something people could maybe pull up from just the YouTube material. But overall, I still think it's a, it's a nice, it does what you want it to do. It, it flushes out the film a little more. But I like the fact that the film doesn't, the, the supplements don't overinterpret the film because I think part of the strength of this film is allowing the audience to kind of just think and consider and draw conclusions from what they're watching and hearing. Uh, and so the fact that there isn't kind of an overall definitive statement from Scorsese or from De Niro or Pacino or whoever about this movie really, I think, makes the supplements even better because they could easily have gone, I think, down the road of overstating, over-explaining what the movie's about and what's happening in it. And so I really like that. So I thought it was a good release. Visually, uh, I, I did take some time just to compare it to the Netflix uh, streaming, which on Netflix you can watch the film in 4K. This obviously is not 4K from uh, from 
Criterion. It's just uh, HD. Uh, but I still actually kind of found myself liking the Blu-ray release more than the 4K streaming from Netflix. I thought that it was hmm. overall a little, a little more balanced. Uh, and I thought that uh, the fact that it had a little bit, you know, the four, the 4K obviously would have that HDR from Netflix. I thought the lack of HDR on the, the Blu-ray actually kind of helps with getting some of the the nature of how it was shot better than the, the 4K HDR on Netflix does. Uh, so I, I kind of actually found myself enjoying it more on Blu-ray than on Netflix. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts about the transfer in relation to Netflix. Yeah, I, I, I did not see the 4K stream. Um, so originally I just streamed it in, in 1080. And, and this looks better than that for sure. I mean, the, the Blu-ray is just much, um, much more of a... Uh, a detailed, stable image, you know, compared to the streaming. So I, I could certainly tell a difference. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a great, great release, and it's nice that the entire film is on one, one Blu-ray and not, not split up or anything. So um, yeah, I, I was very excited that Criterion was putting this out. I mean, they, they obviously have a relationship with Netflix at this point, and and Scorsese himself, and. I think we were all hoping that this would happen when we heard that Netflix was um, releasing the film because, of course, not all of their films have seen uh, physical releases. But, um, yeah, here we are. We've, we've got it on disc and, and um, very thankful for that. It is so weird, Matt, because I remember thinking to myself, the idea that a, a Scorsese film would just be on a streaming service yeah, just that, it seemed wrong to me. I was like, no, 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 it's got to come out on Blu-ray, right? So when this was announced, I was I was over the moon uh, when they when the Criterion announced that they had uh, made an agreement with Netflix to release some of their films, and this was going to be one of them. So I was very much yeah, pleased with it. I'm glad to have it in the collection myself. And I think we probably both have already made it clear what our thought is on this question, but I will pose it, Matt. Does the Irishman belong in the Criterion Collection? Absolutely not. No, of course. Uh, yeah, it, it it deserves to be there. I think, you know, not just because I really think it's one of Scorsese's strongest films, uh, but I, I, I think it's an important film too. I mean, Scorsese's obviously an important director, but you know, this film like we were talking about earlier, really represents a paradigm shift, I think, in terms of the history of cinema. You know, here's a film that that is still truly a feature film, but is allowed the breathing room it requires because it was released through a streaming service, right? And that, I think, marks a, a important historical landmark in the history of cinema. And, of course, the use of visual effects and de-aging, I mean, I, I think that's significant here, too. Uh, but also as really a coda for Scorsese's contributions to the mob genre and to the performances by these actors themselves. Um, so th there's a lot of dimensions here that I think are important within um, cinema history. So it definitely needs to be included in the collection, I think. I would, of course, obviously 100% agree. It definitely belongs there. Obviously, it's only a year old at this point, and it is not a massive cultural phenomenon. I mean, I think I can't remember really the last time someone talked about it, uh, but I do think it still is an important film. Important doesn't mean popular. It doesn't mean critically acclaimed. This got good reviews, but it wasn't over-the-moon reviews. Uh, so I think that this was... Uh, this is an important film. I think you could say that right now. I think it's going to obviously be seen as an important film as you look back at it for the reasons you stated, uh, and especially because it is, in many ways, it's both the end and the start of a new era in how feature-length motion pictures are made. Uh, there's obviously short films. There's these kind of serial films that are taking place now, like The, the Haunting of Bly Manor that came out recently on Netflix. It's kind of a uh, just a long serial film that's take that you know that exists, and this movie here is kind of a, it's kind of the end of the the old fashioned traditional, ma massive epic. I don't think we're going to see three and a half hour films again. You know, 
Uh, but it's also kind of the also maybe the the door to where those films could continue to exist uh, being on streaming. And so I do really uh, think that it, it stands as an important sort of bridge in how movies are being understood and told and and allowed to be produced. So hands down belongs in the Criterion Collection. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for our podcast this evening. Uh, please join us next month when we'll be discussing Terrence Malick's The Tree of Life, which will be premiering in February. Thank you, and keep collecting.